time passes and cities develop and change. This short series sets out to explore some of the lost monuments and buildings of Nottingham. Those items that exist only in the memory of a past by a few faded photographs. One such monument is the Walter Fountain, which was situated at the junction of Greyfriar Gate, Lister Gate and Carrington Street. Designed by Richard Sutton, it was commissioned in the memory of Mr John Walter MP. John Walter originally ran and edited the Times newspaper, having taken over from his father, also called John Walter. His interest in politics was so great that he became a Conservative MP for Nottingham in 1847, holding his seat for 10 years. And it was his son again, John, also a Conservative MP, who paid for the Walter Fountain to be built in memory of his late father at a cost of £1,000, which is equivalent to around £100,000 in today's money. His foundation stone was laid in 1865, and the Walter Fountain was opened on the 3rd of July 1866 with great pomp and circumstance, along with a handing out of the Adam's Ale from the fountain and backed by a violent thunderstorm. The Walter Fountain was a Gothic structure standing 40 feet tall, made from Aberdeen granite and inset with marble plaques with inscriptions. However, the fountain itself had an unfortunate history. In 1916, it was damaged when a Zeppelin raid killed three and injured 11 people. On the 27th of July 1939, 73-year-old Snenton man William George Bradbury of Hawkridge Street was sitting on the steps of the fountain when the poles of a speeding trolley bus hit it, causing a lump of masonry to fall 20 feet, hitting Mr Bradbury on the head, causing fatal injuries. In September 1950, more masonry fell from the structure and it was demolished not long after when the road was widened. Interestingly though, the following relics were found when the Walter Fountain was demolished. They were a glass jar containing copies of the local newspapers, coins, documents and pieces of Nottingham lace from 1860s. It is a shame in the end that the Walter Fountain was demolished when you consider that eventually the area in which it stood would become pedestrianised again, although I'm sure the town planners of the time would have removed it anyway as it was not in keeping with the new concrete structures which formed part of the redevelopment. As we said in episode 1, as a city, Nottingham has developed and changed over the years. For instance, those of you aged around 20 or 30 will know Trinity Square as an area for eating and drinking. For those of you aged 30 to 60, you remember a multi-storey car park which always smelt a bit dodgy first thing in the morning. However, those of you who are 60 years or older will remember the area as housing the Holy Trinity Church, which is a real subject of this video. The church was built on an area of land originally called Burton Lees to cater for the growing population living in the city centre. It cost around £10,000 to build, which is just under £1 million nowadays. Designed by the architect Henry Isaac Stevens, the foundation stone was laid on the 23rd of April 1840 and the church was finally consecrated on the 13th of October 1841 by John Kay, the Bishop of Lincoln. Its external dimensions were 129 foot by 64 foot, with a square tower on which was a nocturnal lantern 24 feet high and topped by a spire rising to 29 feet. The spire itself was a total of 172 feet and was the tallest in Nottingham. The actual area of the church including the burial ground was over 4,000 square feet. Although the church had been built to cope with the growing inner city population, 60 years later, its existence started to come under threat. The construction of a train line along with the building of Victoria Station required the removal of working class housing and the relocating of a population to the outlying areas of the city centre. In 1896, Nottingham City Council purchased land on all four sides of the church and created the area we know today as Trinity Square. It was in 1935 the demolition of the church was first proposed. However, the church was given a reprieve, and it was St Mark's Church further down the road which was demolished instead. In 1942, the spire was found to be in poor condition, following a hundred years of exposure to the elements and shock damage from nearby German air raids, eventually leading for it to be declared unsafe and finally removed. The congregation, though, continued to decline, and eventually, despite a petition of some 16,000 people, the church was closed in 1956 shortly after it was demolished and the area redeveloped. All the church's fixtures, fittings, plaques and displays 
were taken to the newly built Holy Trinity Church on the Clifton Estate, where they remain hidden and neglected in the boiler room. The church was replaced with a 411 space multi-storey car park for first in the city. However, the car park quickly gained a bad reputation of being a little bit unsafe at night and often smelling quite nasty in the morning. In 2006, the car park was demolished and Trinity Square was redeveloped yet again, this time creating a more open square with a plethora of eating establishments. Although the demolition of a church is a great loss to the city landscape, it is the ultimate irony that the nasty concrete structure which replaced it was itself flattened within 40 years and the area redeveloped and opened up to the population once more. It is usual for people to become vocal as town centres develop and much-loved buildings are demolished to make way for modernisation. It's less common for people to weep openly as the demolition starts. Such was the overwhelming emotions when the much-beloved Black Boy Hotel of Nottingham was erased forever from the city's landscape in 1969. The Black Boy itself began its life sometime in the 17th century as a coaching inn and later became part of a charitable organisation called the Mansfield Charities, set up by Samuel Brunt, the hotel providing income for this charity. It was the renowned Nottingham architect Watson Fothergill who rebuilt the hotel in his own indomitable style between 1886 and 1888 and then redesigned the frontage on Long Row between 1897 and 1900. A central tower was created with stone lions at the base and a statue of Samuel Brunts mounted over the front entrance. Further renovations in 1928 saw local artist Denham Davis commissioned to paint two murals in the Haddon Room depicting views of Haddon Hall. However, the long-term effects of tobacco smoke led to these being covered up. The reception rooms were impressive, with four of the main rooms being named after famous local country houses Haddon, Thorsby, Rufford and Chatsworth. There was also an American style bar, gentleman's only bar, writing room and even a hairdressing salon. Throughout the years the hotel was visited by a multitude of celebrities such as Gracie Fields, George Formby, Gregory Peck, Laurence Olivier. A tale is even told of the Australian cricket team being kept awake by the chiming of the bells from the council house while the England team slept soundly a few miles away. It was described in the official guide to Nottingham of 1939 as Being established centuries ago as a posting house by judicious planning and reconstruction it has been transformed into one of the most up-to-date hostelries in the Midlands. There are 90 bedrooms all fitted with hot and cold running water Several bedrooms have communicating private bathroom and toilet accommodation. Self-contained suites are also available. The hotel is centrally heated and all floors are served by electric lifts. The Black Boy enjoys an unrivalled reputation for its catering and has excellent accommodation for banquets, balls and social functions of all kind. The hotel even got a mention in the 1955 film The Coldit Story starring John Mills and Eric Portman where John Mills is talking to a French prisoner. Yes, I speak English. I have stayed before the war at Nottingham. Good egg. Know the black boy? By the 1960s though, the building was in need of modernisation and the lease was offered for sale. Nobody wanted it. The building was eventually purchased by Littlewoods for the next 99 years, starting at a price of £46,000 per year and finally closed its doors on the 8th of March 1969. In an act of full-scale modern vandalism, it was demolished a year later to make way for the Littlewood store, currently occupied by Primark. The statue of Samuel Brunts was given to the Brunts School in Mansfield, where it remains today, albeit with its left hand missing. The four stone lions which guarded the central tower were bought by the Nottingham Corporation and can now be found in the grounds of Nottingham Castle. In reality though, the building was old and renovations would have been massively expensive. No one was prepared to buy the building as a going concern given the money needed to be invested. However, that still doesn't mean the loss of the hotel isn't a great loss to the city of Nottingham. However, perhaps the residents of Nottingham would have been happier if a fabulously designed hotel wasn't replaced by a hideous eyesore block of concrete instead, but with something more in keeping with that which it replaced and its surroundings. 
For some, there's always been a level of romance about the golden age of steam trains, even though to others they were dirty, noisy and smelly. And perhaps it's this romantic notion that keeps Nottingham Victoria Station alive in the memory of those who saw it. Opened on the 24th of May 1900, Nottingham Victoria Station was shared between Grand Central Railway and Great Northern Railway. Neither could agree on a suitable name, so it was finally named Victoria Station, as the opening date coincided with the monarch's birthday. The station's construction was on an epic scale, over a 13-acre site at a cost of £473,000, which would come in at just around £53 million in today's money. It called for the clearance of 1,300 houses, 24 public houses and one church. 46,000 cubic metres of sandstone was also cleared from the site. The three-storey building was constructed of best quality red-faced bricks and Dollydale stone in a renaissance style, the clock tower reaching 30 metres into the air. The station itself comprised of two large island platforms approximately 30 metres long with a total of 12 platform faces. Each island consisted of dining rooms, tea rooms, kitchens, waiting rooms, toilets and even sleeping facilities for the staff, all lined with glazed tiles. It was indeed a magnificent building. It's hard to believe then that it took just one government report in 1963 to alter the face of a city in so many drastic ways. But this is what happened when Richard Beeching produced his now infamous report, The Reshaping of the British Railways, which were losing money hand over fist. The general decline of the railways hit hard in the 1960s as services were cut, the steam rolling stock became unreliable and the lines didn't benefit from the new diesel locomotives. The doors finally closed on Nottingham Victoria on the 4th of September 1967. The site was demolished not long afterwards with only the clock tower as a final remnant of a grand Victorian building. The Victoria Shopping Centre now occupies the site along with Victoria Flats. The clock station tower still remains today and the blocked off tunnels are visible from the shopping centre's car park. It is very incredibly ironic that the motor car, which ultimately brought about the demise of the railways, has, with concerns over congestion and the environment, become the reason for the cause of the reopening of the original train lines. And many would argue that the Beeching Report itself was a short-sighted vision of an idealised future. In the four previous Lost from Nottingham videos, and if you haven't seen them, please go back and check them out, the lost items in question were removed during the city renovations of the 1950s and 60s. In many cases, to some people, this took place before they were born and therefore is classed as past history. This video is different. The changes in question only took place in 2007 and could probably be remembered by everybody watching this video. The changes still remain controversial even now. I am of course referring to the redevelopment of the Old Market Square. Old Market Square has always been a focal point in the centre of Nottingham going back hundreds of years. It's the third biggest square in the UK and occupies 22,000 square metres. The Nottingham Exchange stood over the Market Square for 200 years prior to the erection of a council house, occupied by busy markets, obvious really, as well as the original home of the Nottingham Goose Fair. The square was redeveloped in 1927 along with the building of the council house. This redevelopment, known colloquially as Slab Square due to the high number of concrete slabs used, was a more ornate square with a central processional way with raised platforms to either side. When completed there were flower beds either side of the processional way near the council house with similar ones on the western side with a circular pool and single fountain. These were removed in the 1950s, however the two flower beds on the eastern side were rebuilt as large pools with multiple fountains in each. The old market square was popular with everyone with places to sit and watch the city pass by. In 
In the past, the square has been filled with crowds welcoming the cup-winning teams of Nottingham Forest, the Olympic champions Torval and Dean, as well as a host of other events and royal visits. And of course, we can't forget the square being packed on New Year's Eve along with a giant Christmas tree. By the turn of a century though, the old market square was looking a little tired. Filled with flocks of pigeons and their associated mess, the fountains were often filled with bubble bath creating a giant foamy monster, and the toilets at the western end, well, they just smelled bad. The old market square was controversially redeveloped in 2007 at a cost to the city's taxpayers of £17 million. And despite this cost, no buildings were erected or demolished, but it just covered the cost of the multi-shaded granite stones bought in. The square is now a fully accessible, single-level area with a water feature dominating the eastern side where the toilets used to be, with jets of water shooting into the air and pools which seem to be filled with kids every day during the sunny summer holidays. Now on a level tier, the square seems to spend a large amount of time being filled with market stalls, fun fairs, as well as the seasonal Nottingham by the Sea and Ice Rink. There's even been a Nottingham Eye Ferris wheel installed several times over the years. Many complain the new square is soulless, and to be honest, when it's empty, it's just a vast open space of granite with nothing to break it up. The old market square was indeed looking tired, dirty and worn, and did need a makeover of some sort. However, it's hard not to think that for 17 million, they could have done a little better. Lido's, which are an outdoor swimming pool, became popular around the 1930s, with a total of 169 being built across the UK. There were different shapes and sizes, and were enjoyed by the population for a number of years. Those of a certain age will be able to remember popping down to the Lido during the school summer holidays and spending those six weeks lying in the sun and splashing around in the pool. At the height of their popularity, from the 1930s to the 1980s, people would flock to them in their country over. Nottingham was lucky to have five such Lidos. Well, there is a six, but it didn't really last that long. And in this video, we'll look at some of the surviving photos.
In reality, those dodgy English summers and the appeal of a holiday in a warmer climate spelled the end for the Lidos. One by one they were closed, with Bulwell Lido closing in 2003 despite great opposition from members of the public. The sites of all the Lidos now have been redeveloped, many with housing on top of them. And now, during those really warm summers we've been experiencing recently, there's nowhere similar to go. And those days of splashing in the pool at your local Lido are just memories of the past. Many of the buildings and monuments we've spoken about before have lasted for many years before falling into ruin or being redeveloped. This is different. You could even argue it shouldn't be on this list, it was only ever intended as a temporary structure. However, when you look at the pictures, I'm sure you'll change your minds. The Victorian age saw many advances in technology and they liked nothing more than to show them off. You'll all have heard of the great exhibitions of London, Crystal Palace, etc but you may not be aware that Nottingham held two of these as well. In 1903, the Midland Industrial Exhibition was bought to the banks of the River Trent next to the Nottingham Forest football ground by two Hungarian brothers, Charles and Albert Kilraffy. Their father, the impresario Imre Kilraffy, had also been responsible for some of the big London exhibitions, so they were well qualified. The grand building was dubbed the Ivory Palace and was built in an Indian Mughal style as you can see from the photographs, it was impressive indeed. The land was taken on a short term lease and the work began on the building at a cost of £50,000 which is around £425,000 in today's money. They weren't short of a few bob. Things didn't go well for them though, they employed two contractors who started at opposite ends of the building. Delays were experienced, and when the building was finally complete, the builders met in the middle and were a few inches, or depending on the sources, several feet out of line. Later reports suggested that parts of it were cheaply put together with highly flammable painted wooden materials over a girder framework. Within the grounds themselves, there was a Canadian log flume, an American roller coaster reaching almost 100 feet high, miniature railway, Japanese tea house, hedge maze and a fairy river. There was even a photo studio, electric theatre and a concert hall. After two weeks of opening, a total of 320,000 people had visited the site, including King George V and Queen Alexandra. A local newspaper of the time reported that the enterprise is so American in its novelty, smartness and up-to-date completeness that one may be pardoned for suggesting, in a phrase very popular over the water, that it is the greatest thing in the way of entertainment that has ever happened in Nottingham. It all seemed too good to be true, and perhaps it was. On Saturday the 2nd of July at around 8.30pm, while the place was packed with many listening to the band of the Manchester Regiment, smoke was seen issuing from the scenery at the rear of the Fairy River, ironically named for the second season, the River Styx. The fire spread rapidly, the dry timbers catching fire quickly, and it spread engulfing large parts of the exhibition before spreading to the Nottingham Forest Football Club next door and destroying the pavilion stand, dressing rooms and offices. Fortunately, there was no loss of life, but it meant that after a mere 14 months, the exhibition closed and the site was cleared, remaining empty for a number of years, until finally a large hotel was built in its place, later becoming the Civic Centre and then converted into apartments. And there ends the sad short story of the Ivory Palace, a unique but short-lived building. It would have been nice if a building had survived, the buildings after it obviously never had the splendour of the Ivory Palace. However, regarding the construction, I think there's a lesson for us all to learn there. In an earlier episode of Lost from Nottingham, we looked at the old market square from its building with the council house in 1929 to its redevelopment in 2007. And if you didn't see that, please click on the link above. The one thing we never touched on though was what was there before the council house? So let's put that right. 
Built between 1724 and 1726 as the main offices of the Nottingham Corporation, the Nottingham Exchange cost £2,400, which is just over £500,000 in today's money. It was a four-storey building with an 11-bay frontage, about 123 feet long, which is about 37 metres. Around the bottom of the Exchange was a variety of shops and stalls, including at the rear, the open-air slaughterhouse and meat market known as the Shambles. Inside was a great hall used for concerts, elections, meetings and exhibitions. The architect was also the mayor of the time, one Marmaduke Pennell. A clock was added a few years later in 1728 by the clockmaker James Woolley of Codner. The exchange underwent a major reconstruction between 1814 and 1815 at a cost of £14,000, which is well over a million pounds today. A new clock was introduced in 1830 with a new dial being added in 1836. This was lit by a gas jet until Sunday the 26th of November 1836 when a massive fire broke out causing substantial damage. A new clock was added again in 1881, this time manufactured by Nottingham clockmakers GNF Coke. In 1876 an oddity was added to the exchange. It consisted of a long oblong box containing electrical mechanism and a pole with a large brass ball. This was the standardised time across the country, and once a day the ball was raised to the top of the pole until 1pm when an electrical impulse was transmitted from Greenwich Observatory and caused the ball to drop. It initially caused some excitement, however as time passed by, as you can imagine it became a bit of a joke and once it passed its usefulness it was dismantled in 1887. Eventually, the decision was taken to replace the exchange building, upgrade the market square and make it a more formal and impressive area, almost Vatican City-like. In some respects, it's a shame the exchange is gone. However, I can imagine that by the 1900s it was in a poor state of repair. The fact it was totally demolished to make way for the council house perhaps is proof of this. Pieces do survive, though. The ornate arch window at the front of the building is now in situ in Manor Care Home in Arnold. The original clock face is mounted on the outside wall of the tower at St Nicholas Church in the city centre, the workings of which are in the Nottingham Industrial Museum. The final clock is mounted in St Helen's Church in Trowell. The timing was right for the redevelopment. Any earlier we could have had something Victorian, and any later into the 20th century, well, it would have been square and concrete. If constructed now, oh, probably a fancy steel or glass structure maybe. But today we're left with an impressive council house building itself, and although yes it needs a bit of a clean, it still dominates the marketplace in a way the exchange never could. In past videos we've looked at things which are lost from the Nottingham landscape, things we can mourn and regret at the folly of their removal. This video represents a different folly, the building of something which was such a monumental waste of money that it caused misery for people and was eventually demolished in less than 20 years. In the 1960s, plans were put into place to transform Nottingham housing forever. The craze of building prefabricated high-rise flats swept the nation, and Nottingham was no different. Lenton, Radford, Woolerton all had their own complexes. But the biggest of all was the site in Baysford. In 1962, the Nottingham City Corporation started to clear a swathe of properties from an area in Baysford, encompassed by Davids Lane, Lincoln Street, Percy Street and Stockhill Lane. These buildings were in poor condition, outside toilets and seen by many as not fit to live in. The dream of high-rise living was seen as a way forward, plus it was quick to build and reduced urban sprawl. In 1968, work started on a new complex comprising of four 20-storey blocks of flats with others between three and eight storeys, with continuous walkways between them called deck access flats. By its completion in May 1971, a total of 822 homes were created although this figure does vary depending on where you look. There were four high-rise tower blocks named after local streets they'd replaced. Mill Court, Auburn Court, Wicklow Court and Evans Court. 
There were also 10 low-rise blocks named after mountain rangers called Morven, Quarrymore, Kinloch, Allenby, Bannock, Calgary, Glengarry, Ferryden, Eaglesham and Dura. It didn't take long for problems to show up. The flats were poorly designed and built like a house of cards using prefabricated concrete panels. Former residents talk about damp, condensation, noise, doors banging, people arguing. There's even stories of people killing themselves by jumping from a great height. The lift smelt of urine and the crime level rose. Baseford Flats lasted a total of just 17 years. The bulldozers moved in and by 1985 the flats were obliterated from the city's skyline forever, unmissed and unmourned. A traditional housing estate was later built in its place. Perhaps in the case of this video, it should be called Lost from Nottingham and Good Riddance. When people talk about Nottingham in the old days, they talk with reverence about one particular street which sadly is no more. When photos are posted in various Nottingham Facebook groups, the followers wax lyrical about this street and bemoan the fact it finally met the bulldozers at the start of the 1970s. That street is Drury Hill. Drury Hill ran from where the low pavement entrance to Broadmarsh Centre stood and exited further down Broadmarsh. Now, Drury Hill has nothing to do with Drury Lane in London. It was previously called Vault Lane and Parking Lane until 1620 when it became known as Drury Hill, named after Alderman Drury, who was a wealthy shoemaker at the time, known then as a cordwainer. It was known as Drury Hill ever since, and at one stage was one of Nottingham's major thoroughfares. At its narrowest, the road was just 4 foot 10 inches wide. Signs were posted at the end to alert any traffic. It is said that shopkeepers could stand in their doorways and reach across a road and shake hands with each other. It's not the steepest of Nottingham Hills, but to give you an idea, imagine the old low pavement entrance to Broadmarsh and the escalators leading you down to the lower levels. When you take a look at the old photographs of Drury Hill today, the buildings look tired and ready to fall to pieces, but from a historical viewpoint, its narrowness, haphazard buildings and general demeanour give the image of an old Tudor street. Drury Hill is one of those streets that has no real place in a modern city like Nottingham. Perhaps it could have been saved, perhaps it could have been preserved as a historical feature and a tourist attraction. These thoughts were not in the minds of the city council at the time, and arguably still aren't, and despite fierce opposition in 1969, Drury Hill met with the bulldozers to prepare the way for the White Elephant, now known as a Broadmarsh shopping centre. 